Good afternoon. My name is Graham Wilson, and I'm the director of the Initiative on Cities at Boston University. We're the unit in Boston University that explores the challenges and the opportunities facing cities here in the United States and also globally. We often talk about the fact that we are now in the age of the city, that over, the, over half the world's population lives in cities, and that proportion is set to continue growing. And it's growing at a particularly fast rate in Africa, the continent where urbanization is proceeding most rapidly. Rapid uh, urbanization has not always been a happy story from the growth of cities in Britain and in the Industrial Revolution to the development of favelas in Latin America, cities have often experienced problems as they grow dramatically. On the other hand, cities also represent agglomerations of talent that contribute powerfully culturally and economically to the life of their nations. So this is a moment of both challenge and opportunity for Africa. We're delighted to put on this seminar with the partnership of the African Studies Center at Boston University, uh, which uh, Tim Longman, uh, my colleague, will tell you a little bit more about later. My main job is to tell you about the wonderful panel that we've been able to put together to talk about Big City Africa. I'm going to start with, uh, with Astrid Haas, who is the policy director in the center, the International Growth Center previously head of the Cities That Work program there, and somebody who has extensive experience working for the government of Kenya and in Rwanda, Uganda, and Malawi. Uh, Astrid, thank you so much for joining us. We're joined by Marcus Walton, a colleague of mine in the Department of Political Science. His PhD is from Brown University. He's also taught at the Witwatersrand University in South Africa. And his specialism is in African politics with a focus on protest in African cities. We're joined by uh, Sir Paul Collier, who is Professor of Economics at Oxford University and is also a Fellow of St Anthony's College there. He is, uh, holds uh, also appointments at Sciences Po in Paris and is Director of the International Growth Centre. Paul has uh, done very distinguished work in development economics. His work is characterised not only by sharp economic analysis, but by compassion and a breadth of intellectual vision. Uh, so we are particularly delighted to have him talking about this topic. He's the author of highly readable, as well as extremely important books, such as The Bottom Billion, about poverty globally, The Plundered Planet, How to Reconcile Prosperity with Nature, and The Future of Capitalism, uh, a very stimulating and important book about the future of our economies. So thank you so much for joining us. I also want to introduce, introduce my colleague from political science, Tim Longman. He is director of the BU African Studies Center and also the, of the Institute on Culture, Religion and World Affairs. The focus of his research has been on uh, human rights and transitional justice with two important books published by Cambridge University Press on aspects of the genocide uh, in Rwanda. Tim has done great service for African studies at BU, doing a great deal to build up, strengthen and advance our African Studies Center, which is recognized as one of the most important in the United States. Tim, I'm going to hang over to you with thanks for uh, moderating the discussion and to tell us more about the African Studies Center. Great, <clears throat> thank you very much, Graham. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, the African Studies Center at BU is one of the oldest and largest in the United States. Um, we uh, teach a range of African languages uh, and encourage the inclusion of uh, Africa throughout the uh, curriculum uh, at BU. And so we're particularly pleased to have this opportunity to uh, partner with the, the Initiative on the Cities um, and uh, to talk about this uh, important uh, issue of urbanization in Africa. Um, 
I'm going to start with a few questions for our panelists, um, and then I'll uh, turn things over to um, the uh, people who are attending the seminar. As, as you'll notice if you're watching this, there is a Q&A button down on the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen, and you can type in your questions there, and I will uh, try to sort them out and, and read them off. So um, after we've had uh, 15, 20 or so minutes of conversation um, among the, the panel, we'll open up to questions and uh, try to have a, a fairly free-flowing conversation today. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, Astrid to ask if you could give us a little bit of background on what is the state of urbanization in Africa? I think uh, when people think of Africa, they often don't think of cities, they think of uh, the desert or the rainforest or the savannas. Um, so what, what's the situation for urbanization and, and what are some of the issues that, that Africa's rapid urbanization are posing? So first of all, thank you, thank you very much for, for the invite um, to speak on this panel and on my, my favorite topic, which is cities mm -hmm. in Africa. I'm going to actually pick off where, where Graham, Graham mentioned it's Africa's biggest challenge and it's Africa's biggest opportunity, but I'm actually gonna invert that in my remarks and talk about the opportunity first before I talk about the challenge, because it's not just any opportunity. I would argue it is our biggest current opportunity for economic growth and development. And I say this speaking from Kampala, Uganda, which is a rapidly growing city in my own city and a city that I love dearly. And one <clears throat> where people flock to like many other African cities across the continent, because they're looking for opportunities. They're looking opportunities for jobs. They're looking for opportunities for services and they're looking for opportunities most importantly for, for their children and to give their children a better life. This is a trend that is not particular to Africa, but one that we've seen across history and across the globe today, which is you know, moving to a city can be an individual's fastest route from rural poverty to prosperity. Cities are also the preferred locations for firms. So, you know, they like to be in cities because there is a large pool of labor they can match and that obviously has the added benefit of providing jobs for residents. They like being near other firms for their own inputs, but also to learn and for ideas. And they like being near, they like being in cities because they pro provide markets, not only the market of the city themselves, but if you think of most cities, uh, like your own in, in, in Boston, it has, you know, for example, an airport, which enables, you know, trade with regional and, and global markets. And this, this particular feature of cities, the, the feature of sort of being attractive to firms, allows them to, to come together, to specialize, to scale, to grow. And this is what drives productivity and growth. And this is what makes cities such a, a powerful force for growth, uh, not only for the cities themselves, but whole economies. And this is what we saw with the Industrial Revolution. It's what we also saw most recently with the East Asian miracle or China's um, sort of impressive development path. But um, why do I say it's an opportunity for, for Africa in particular? Well, uh, Graham mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, we're the fastest urbanizing continent. And, you know, in fact, moreover, I think it's important to note that we have two thirds of our cities are yet to be built. Uh, and, and a lot of these are not, you know, the, the title of this seminar is Big City Africa. But in fact, some of our fastest growing cities are our intermediary cities or the ones that we don't even know exist yet. The challenge is that this window of opportunity is very small. So it is estimated that in the next 30 or so years, an additional 2.5 billion people are going to be added to cities and 90% of those are going to come from Africa and from, um, from Asia. And to date, and this is now where I shift to the challenge part of the story, our, our, our ability to, to manage cities and our trajectory with cities hasn't been particularly positive. So whilst a lot of African cities, again, including my own Kampala, are very dense with people, they're not necessarily dense with firms. And why are they not dense with firms? Because the investment climate is not favorable. I was saying at the outset just now when we were sitting waiting for this uh, seminar to begin that, you know, in any case, you know, if I suddenly disappear, it may be because my internet goes down or my power goes out because we've just had a thunderstorm, which I think epitomizes the challenge, like what, which firms can't operate without a stable power supply. At the same time, if there's a lack of firms, there's a lack of jobs for all of those people who are coming to the cities to find jobs, but they do need to still survive. And so what happens is, is that they move into the informal sector and they, they, they need, in most cases, to be able to make a living. And the informal, uh, the urban informal sector in Africa employs an estimated 66% of people. 
Now, the, I'm not, the, the informal sector is an incredibly thriving and vibrant economy, but it has the challenge that it doesn't allow firms to, to grow in the same way as they are able to in the formal economy. So a survey of the informal sector in Kampala in the greater Kampala area in 2016 showed approximately 53% uh, of these firms were just one employee. So just a self-employed person, for example, selling goods. And of those firms, about 60% had an annual turnover of $2,700 or less. And already in 2016, so this is pre-COVID and pre-lockdown times, 93% of micro firms were operating close to or at the poverty line. So this is very much um, firms for survival as opposed to firms for, for, for thriving and for that scale and specialization that I, I spoke about before. And what, what this then has is the added on effect that for the city, this provides a very low base from which they, they can collect tax revenue. So again, taking my own city as an example, we're a city of about 2 million people by night, 4 million people by day, and we have an own source revenue base of $25 million. Now, I, you know, I don't know whether there are any city leaders on the call, but I don't think that that's very much money to run a city and public services on. At the same time as being expensive for firms, these cities are also very expensive for the people who live in there. So we have a very, a lot of the cities across the continent are sprawling. People have to live further and further out to be able to afford, to, to be able to live, to afford housing, but the jobs are close to the center. And so with this, they spend, for example, an inordinate amount of their, their, their income on just traveling to their job. And so, for example, there is estimates that for the same distance and adjusted for GDP, a bus fare in Lusaka, Zambia is 11 times the bus fare of in Mumbai in India for the same distance. But what this then has is the vicious cycle that as it is expensive for people, people will require higher wages, which then becomes even more unattractive for firms to locate into the city. And this, this is the vicious cycle that many of our cities find themselves in right now. Okay. But I go back and I would just find, finish on, on the opportunity because I don't want this to be a doom and gloom story, by far not. This is why I'm passionate about it. This is why I work in it. Urbanization is our largest opportunity. But I think what, what I tried to, to show in sort of the brief overview, and obviously there's a, you know, Africa is a huge continent, 54 countries, many cities, many cities to come, a lot of diversity and a lot of potential for urbanization. But it's not just any urbanization, it's well-managed urbanization. And we have the opportunity now with two thirds of our cities to come to put in the right policies, the right infrastructure, the right investments to be able to unleash uh, the power for our cities that are there and for the cities that are yet to be built. Thanks, Astrid. Uh, pa Paul, could, could you tell us a little bit about why cities are struggling in these ways? Why, why are some of the policies that are needed not being implemented? What is it that uh, needs to be done in order to um, address some of the issues that, that Astrid's mentioned? Yeah, so as Astrid said, it's really sort of, it's now or never, because over the next 20, 30 years, two thirds of the city will get built. The two thirds that isn't built that will be there in 2050. And, um, and the third that has been built has produced cities, I wouldn't say like Kampala, but I certainly would say like Nairobi, which are neither very livable nor very productive. And that's the, that's the tragedy. So um, Nairobi is already, it's not a big city by world standards, anything like, but it's already ho horribly congested. Um, and so neither very livable nor very productive. Um, but suppose it then triples by 2050, without changing its form, then it'll be a mega slum, and that will be irreversible. Um, and uh, and as Astrid said, the only sort of enterprises that can function in that environment are these little micro enterprises. But the micro enterprises, no scale, no specialization, so do. So well, how did how did that first third get built so badly, and what can be done to, to, to build the next two thirds much better? And it seems to me that the, the key uh, concept here is that we need um, uh, a community. The city needs to become a community that builds a common purpose around a common understanding. And from that common understanding, it builds a common strategy for how to achieve the common purpose. Um, and and, and the, the, the key step is the final step. If you've got a common strategy 
around a common purpose that you've all agreed to, then you all understand that you've got common obligations um, uh, to actually make all this go, this, this purpose that you've not yet achieved happen. Um, so you know, basically, um, everybody's going to have to pay their taxes. Um, uh, people are actually going to have to follow uh, rules if we have something like bus lanes introduced. Um, uh, people actually have to, when they're driving a car, stay out of the bus lane. Um, basic things like that. Um, and so building that common purpose of, and as Astrid and I were talking a little while before this, and Astrid said, you know, they can't even get to the common purpose because people don't see themselves in, in, in many African cities as a we. Their identity is still rooted in the, the rural community they came from. And they came from many different communities. So you don't even have a we from which to form a, a common purpose. This is what we want to achieve. Um, so um, building some sense of, yes, we're all, we're all different ethnic groups or whatever, but we've got some sense of we all belong to this city. Our future is this city's fame. It determines this city's fame. And um, now, how do you build that common purpose and that common understanding? Um, you do it through dialogue. And what is dialogue? It's analogous to playing ping pong. Um, it's a, it's a, a, an exchange between equals under sort of agreed understanding that you're there at that table to play ping pong and it's a game and it's not legitimate to go around the side of the, the other end of the table and hit your opponent overhead with a bat. Yeah? So there are limits to what you can do. You want to win, but you want to win within the structure of agreed norms. Um, and at the moment, um, in African cities, a lot of it is just there isn't a there isn't that dialogue between people who are seen as equals who all have agency. You can't have a dialogue unless the people in it have agency to participate as equals in that dialogue. And also, only if they have agency can can they be can they be obligation bearing. Um, and so widely shared agency <coughs> in the people in the city is a fundamental thing that has been missing in a lot of Africa. Things have been done by the top to people rather than coming from the bottom and being done by people. Um, so um, my final point before handing over is cities can't be run from by the president of the country issuing commands. What African cities need is not commanders in chief issuing orders. They need trusted communicators in chief who encourage people around forging this common purpose. And so a guided dialogue in which everybody's got agency and everybody's searching for being sort of morally load-bearing, playing their part in the city. Um, and let me give you an example of where that's actually worked over the last 20 years in Africa. And I think it's Lagos, which is one of the biggest cities in Africa. It's huge. And 20 years ago, it was a really, truly unlivable and unproductive and dangerous city. But over the course of the last 20 years, um, three good leaders have actually played that role of we're not just commanders in chief, we're communicators in chief. And they've gradually encouraged in rather simple ways um, to be trusted. So that they've, they've delivered highly visible things that people say, yeah, that makes a difference. And then he tells them, well, you know, you're going to have to pay your taxes if you want things like that. And over that 20 years, different successive um, heads of the region have managed to build the, the revenue base a lot. And so 
They're trusted because they delivered. Um, they're seen as competent and they're seen as acting in the city's interest. So it's feasible, but it does require that building of a common purpose. We need um, communicators in chief, not dictators. And we need everybody to have agency. On that basis, let me um, hand over to Marcus. Sure. Before I uh, turn to Marcus, uh, let me just mention, if you do have questions for our panelists, uh, if you could please put them in the question and answer box um, that you'll find at the bottom of your screen that, that will help us manage them. Um, so, so Paul is talking about the sense of common purpose and the need for dialogue. Uh, but if people have been following the news in Africa um, lately, one of the stories that has uh, broken in even to American newspapers and, and television has been recent um, protests that have turned violent in, in Nigeria, particularly in Lagos. Um, so Marcus, I'm wondering if you can talk about uh, popular protest and uh, what it is that um, uh, may be driving uh, urban African residents to, um, to take to the streets sometimes to uh, demand things. Sure. Um, so building on what Paul is saying, I, I agree that urban governance and politics <clears throat> is uh, oftentimes seen as something that should be top down, but uh, in many ways also needs to be a bottom up process as well. And if you look at um, African politics, urban African politics in particular over the past decade, past 15 years, you've seen a trend of a particular type of mobilization going on, uh, which is mass, mass protests uh, that has essentially exploded uh, since the late 2000s. So there's different databases that measure this, but African Development Bank, I said in the five years before uh, 2011, uh, in the five years after, you saw basically a tripling of, of protests. So between 2011 and 2016, uh, protests as measured by the bank tripled. Um, armed conflict location and event data database, ACLID, uh, argues over a similar framework. Uh, you saw about uh, a couple of years before 2011 and like the four or five years after. Uh, since 2011, you saw about five times, five to six times as much protest. So you've seen a, a huge increase in the amount of street protests often dealing with issues of what we might call politics of social reproduction, public goods. How do you know, citizens access basic resources? How do they reproduce themselves? Um, housing, transportation, energy, um, sanitation, all these very basic issues have come to the forefront and been really important uh, catalysts for popular mobilization in African cities. So examples of this, you can look at uh, uh, protests around food security, which were central to um, the Arab Spring revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia, but also in Sudan, uh, more recently in 2018, dealing with issues around food prices. Uh, Senegal, uh, protests around public space, uh, street vendors uh, in Dakar in, in 2007. More recently, when I was there last January, around electricity prices, uh, fuel subsidies in Nigeria, Mozambique transportation prices. Uh, I experienced very large protests around uh, 2012. The, the famous uh, walk to work protests in Uganda, 2011, also dealing with issues around uh, transportation, food prices, uh, Zambia 2013 around food prices, uh, and South Africa also um, more prominently around housing and other basic services. So this has been a really important trend in looking at African politics in the past decade. Uh, and as we'll get into it, another service to, to consider here is going to be security. So traditionally, political science has been maybe taking note from economics and been more interested in inequality between cities um, in uh, urban and rural areas, basically. More recently, there's been some more attention looking at inequality within cities and within that how citizenship um, is formed through these processes. So with, in addition to that, there's been another trend in thinking about cities uh, more carefully as a transition away from the nation state as a unit of analysis. So how do we think about citizenship beyond the nation state and how do we think, it, think of it within cities? This brings into, into it a lot of different questions, some of which were brought up by Paul in the street, people moving from the rural areas into the city um, how do they make claims on basic goods? What does it mean to be a citizen of the city in that sense? Um, so in thinking about um, the nation state, my own research is, is mostly about understanding how legacies of the nation state have informed this urban politics. And in many ways, urban protest has been um, a consistent current throughout uh, what we would think of traditionally the trajectory of, of African history in the 20th century, whether through colonialism, um, late colonial period as, as Fred Cooper has discussed of labor movements, um, structural adjustment protests of the 80s, the democratic wave of the, of the 1990s, and all these processes you're seeing how urban protest has played a key role. 
Uh, so the question is really, how do we use uh, this kind of history and, and what kind of frameworks are we gonna use to inform our analysis moving forward? For me, I think an important thinker uh, in trying to bring this together is, is Franz Fanon. So Fanon had a very particular understanding of the city what he called the Manichaean city under colonialism. And the main premise is that you essentially have two different sides to the city. One is what uh, you could call um, the settler quarters and the other one what he calls the native quarters. And you see this play out in different colonial contexts. But the basic idea is on one side, you might have uh, you know, an area where services work, where you know, roads are paved, buses run on time, where there's investment, there's planning, uh, people with healthy lives. On the other hand, what he called the native quarters, um, you see uh, a lack of investment, basic services are very difficult to access. Uh, there's a lack of planning, uh, informality. Um, it's very difficult for people to survive and access basic resources. The reason why this is important, and Fanon divided these two, si two sides of the city, one black, one white, the main points he was making and the implications um, that are important for thinking through um, today's politics are that on the one hand, what you get in these colonial contexts is he described it as black and white, but mainly the idea that both economic uh, and the political and social status are essentially fused together um, through this particular painting of the city. Um, so it's not just that the city reflects inequalities, but it also reproduces those inequalities itself. Uh, on the other hand, what Fanon gives us is an understanding of the colonial legacies and how important they are for understanding politics today. Both of which I think really are central elements uh, that have been an undercurrent for, for the protests we've seen in the 21st century. So within this kind of politics of social reproduction, as you might call it, you can see different forms of um, social action, some of which resemble what Asif Bayat has called quiet encroachment. So in, in attempts to try to access basic resources, citizens might be uh, you know, illegally uh, hooking up to, to water pipelines, illegally, uh, legal connections to electricity, building homes uh, informally where they don't necessarily have, uh, have legal tenure, right? And these are uh, standard practices that, are, that citizens have to adapt to in order to survive and to, to access basic resources. Um, on the other hand, you see informal networks. Uh, Abdul Malik Simon is a scholar who studied this a lot and how people have, have used these kind of networks and connections to try to access these basic resources. But sometimes because these issues these political and economic issues can intertwine and are fused together through this particular uh, inequality within the city. Uh, you can see popular mobilization um, uh, and, and large scale action um, that can occur whether under certain conditions or over certain particular issues uh, that can spark protests. So thinking about the, the NSARS movement in Nigeria, this is one of those types of issues in many ways. Uh, to give a, a framework to try to think about it, uh, the Anti-robbery units in, in Nigeria basically were formed in the 1980s. So in the 1980s in Nigeria, you have economic downturn, you have structural adjustment, um, you have military rule. Um, so lack of democracy, um, lack of economic growth, uh, cities are urbanizing. You have a crime wave essentially going on. And in an attempt to try to resolve that, this is under uh, General Buhari, before he was President Buhari. So in, during his first term in the 80s, he, uh, there's an expansion of the police and also creation of these uh, robbery units. Uh, this particular robbery unit, um, the one in Lagos was developed in the late 90s. It came out of these, these different programs in the 80s. So in the early 90s, you have what's called a special anti-robbery squad um, developed in Lagos. And the main idea is similar to try to fight a crime wave and try to, to combat uh, organized uh, uh, armed robbery that was going on in the city. So the mandate for these particular units, or this one in Lagos at least, uh, was essentially could be arrests, plainclothes officers, uh, roadblocks uh, that were supposed to infiltrate or listen to airwaves and try to stop these, uh, these different forms of organized crime. In reality, what you get is extortion, corruption, uh, violence on the one hand, uh, in the more extreme cases, extrajudicial kidnappings, murder, torture. Uh, there's testaments of people who've been kidnapped and gone for almost 40 days. Their family doesn't hear anything. In some cases, people have never been heard from again, um, or their family has to basically sell their house to try to get them out of jail. And this is for crimes that there's absolutely, you know, very little evidence for, oftentimes based on what someone might look like. So the targets are often young males, not only males, but oftentimes young males. Um, more recently, if you have a, you know, a smartphone, you have a nice car, you have a laptop, uh, uh, they've been targeted in many ways by these, uh, by these crime units. So in the early 2000s, this, uh, this unit spread from Lagos to the rest of Nigeria. Uh, and the issues around police brutality, if we can call it police brutality, um, I think it goes a little bit beyond that, but 
you know, for the sake of, of just conceptually capturing this, let's say police brutality uh, has been brought up in the 2000s. There's several different hearings and trying to address many of these issues. So this is actually a long-standing issue um, in Nigeria, but one that hasn't gotten nearly as, as, as much attention as we've seen more recently. Um, it also feeds into this idea uh, that President Buhari mentioned in 2018, it's this idea of young people as being lazy, economically unproductive, right? unable to, um, to produce something for the economy, basically wanting to, to um, live off of the oil wealth of the country. This is a discourse that was popularized um, through Buhari. And in many ways, protesters were, were rebuking that um, through these protests. But it's part of this, this similar type of discourse, which in a sense almost justifies these forms of violence um, against young people, where many, many cases are just completely innocent. Um, so the protests themselves, the NSARS hashtag at least, was created around 2016 and 2017. And this shows you that this was very clearly a, a very particular political moment in which this exploded. Now, the backdrop to this, uh, looking just beyond even COVID, but more recently this past fall, uh, uh, President Buhari initiated several different, uh, different forms of austerity or reforms, one of which was to uh, uh, increase the price of fuel, which has been a long-standing uh, political issue, increase the price of electricity. Uh, so there was a large amount of, of, of mobilization around this particular issue with, uh, with labor unions. There was a standoff going on at a particular time around September. Uh, and right at that same, same amount of time, uh, that's when these protests essentially started. So on October 3rd, there was a, a tweet sent out uh, that essentially addressed uh, an instance of SARS violence against a young man living in, um, in Delta State. Now, prior to this, right before the lockdown, um, in February, a footballer in Delta State, which is, in, which is South South, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, had, had been shown on the internet as well. And October 3rd, the incident was in Ondu State, which is slightly north of Lagos. Marcus, if you, so, you can, we're getting a lot sorry. of questions, so if you can wrap oh, up. Oh, sorry, yeah, I'll get through it. Very quick. So um, the movement itself was catalyzed around that particular event, uh, often, led by middle-class youth, civil society groups, uh, some groups in particular like Enough is Enough Nigeria, Feminist Coalition, other professional associations. And many of the claims were, were speaking to these issues I mentioned before. Uh, one of the, the types of grievances was to say, to be modern is not a crime, speaking to this idea of, of you know, driving a nicer car, having a laptop, having a, a cell phone or something to that extent shouldn't be criminalized. But the mans were around uh, releasing protesters uh, compensation for the rest of, uh, for, for victims, uh, independent body to oversee police misconduct, psychological evaluations for the, for the police. And interestingly enough, in contrast to the U.S., uh, and funding of the police as opposed to defunding the police. And speaking to these issues of a lack of funding for these basic services and how that in itself recreates uh, these different forms of violence and, and inequality. So more, the most recent event um, or the most famous event from this protest was around October 20th uh, uh, during a 24-hour curfew where uh, and Lekki, which is uh, home to a, a very long express peninsula on the edge of, of Lagos, basically, which connects to Lagos Island. The Lekki Expressway was the home base of this particular protest. And uh, at nighttime, uh, uh, the military came in uh, and they were killing of, of at least 12, some people say up to 30 uh, protesters, uh, some of which was, was recorded. However, CCTVs were removed uh, prior to that. So in total, about 50 to 60 protesters were killed during this movement. And this speaks to many of the same issues that we're talking about, the kinds of, of politics around um, uh, social reproduction and basic services uh, that sometimes can catalyze in these types of protests, but oftentimes are a reality for people living in African cities. Great. Um, so we're getting quite a few questions. Uh, if you have, do have a question, uh, you can type it in the Q&A box. Um, uh, one question initially is what's going to be driving the expected growth? Uh, is it going to be in migration from the countryside or from natural po population growth or from, from other uh, factors? I don't know who wants to take that. I think, yeah, I, I think it's, oh, sorry, Paul, you go ahead. <laughs> I think it's mainly um, continued movement in from the countryside. Um, and um, uh, and that's what's historically always fueled urban growth. I mean, the, the big 19th century cities um, uh, of the north of England, which were the first sort of industrial cities, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the congestion and unlivability was so bad um, 
that the population within the cities uh, certainly didn't even reproduce itself. Um, there, there was so, such a high death rate that all the growth in the city and more was driven by in migration from, from peasants coming to live in the city. Uh, and I think that's largely still true in the big cities in Africa, but Astrid will put me right if I'm wrong. Uh, Astrid, um, so there are some questions about the informal economy. If you're talking about um, taxing businesses, for example, and yet you say that so much of the economy is informal, um, how, how is that gonna work? And, and what, uh, what it, are some of the problems for the infrastructure? Um, Clearly, it's not growing at the same scale as population. Um, so I'm wondering if you could uh, sort of talk about. Yeah. That. So I think, uh, so first of all, there are some fantastic questions coming through. So thanks very much for everyone who's asking questions. So I saw, uh, Medea, you, you were sort of straight off the block on how we tax the, the informal economy. And, and, and that's sort of an impossible feat. But, you know, when it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a difficult one, because when they make up such a large part of the city economy, uh, and they are part of the city economy. So they also draw on services and services don't come for free. Someone needs to pay for them. Um, it is important that they are formalized and to be able to be taxed, but also formalized in a way that they can be recognized and they can hold their city governments to accountability. They are in the informal economy, often largely invisible and, and, and not able to hold city governments to account in the same way as if they were formalized. And I think this sort of um, feeds into the question where the absence of the tax base um, and the absence of taxes um, and the absence of money is the reason why infrastructure cannot keep up with, with growth. And that's to, to Daniel's question. Uh, and it's why, you know, Kampala was conceived, I think, I think I, I saw your statistic and I'd read that somewhere, it was conceived of a city of a 150,000 and by 20, I think it's by 2030 or 40, we expect it to be 10 million. So, you know, we have quite a bit of infrastructure to put in and, but we don't have the money to do that. Now, I just wanted to use that point to actually speak to a point that, that, that Paul mentioned in his remarks, which was this sort of top down versus bottom up approach. And, and a little bit to, to Marcus's remarks about the, the, um, the nature of urban protests. You know, cities are, is where this comes to a head. This is where the sort of lack of public services, particularly for people who've moved into the city and are looking for the public services, if they come and they don't find the services or they find the lack of quality of services, that's where, you know, the protest grows. It is also why many of the cities across the continent, including my own, are opposition strongholds in, in countries that don't usually have much tolerance for opposition. And this leads to a, a sort of what I would call a, a schizophrenic approach to the city, because on the one hand, it's an opposition. On the other hand, it's their biggest generator of GDP. There are estimates that, for example, the greater Kampala metropolitan area generates about 60% of GDP for the country. And obviously most of the, even the national taxes, not even just the municipal taxes. So what happens, right? And, and part, of, part of this also then feeds into this whole money question. So I should caveat that like my area that I, in, that I, I look into with my research is municipal finance. You know, cities are very constrained about how they can raise money. And this is not just about the informal economy. It's also about the fact that um, they, there are legislative constraints on what cities can do in terms of raising the money that is needed for the massive investments that, that are needed. Uh, and this is this is part of this 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 approach where it's not clear how national governments see cities and how national governments want to manage cities and that sort of really does come to a head in the form that that Marcus described in terms of of the protests. A, a big opportunity for raising revenue in cities comes from the appreciation in the value of land. Um, as the city grows, if it becomes productive, the land in the city becomes hugely more valuable. And then it's a question of who gets that value? Now, in the growth of London, it was quite clear who got it. The first billionaire in the country was the Duke of Westminster, who managed to get central London, um, you know, about 800 years earlier. Um, and that just became very valuable land, even though he didn't have to do anything to it. Um, so Paul, if I can, if I can jump in, there is, a question, there is a question as well about um, how we can ensure that development and financialization benefit the masses rather than just exacerbating systematic inequality. Yeah, so taxing land is the start. For that, you've got to be able to register who owns the land. Now, that's perfectly feasible. Rwanda managed to register all the land um, very fast and very cheaply. It cost about $6 a plot. 
through a simple um, semi-formal process in which they just um, trained up um, uh, surveyors in very simple techniques and the surveyors went into the community and talked with the community it was back to dialogue they had a, a dialogue in the community and says who owns this bit of land where i'm standing now and what are its borders and the people around would discuss and you know they could fairly rapidly agree this guy owns it and these are the boundaries and that, then they just geo-recorded that um, six dollars a throw. Right? In Dar es Salaam, um, they took the World Bank advice and went through the courts. And of course, the courts are first of all God's gift to the rich, because the rich can hire the lawyers. It ended up costing three thousand dollars a plot, um, which is absolutely prohibitively expensive. So, um, you know, the, the Rwanda managed to hit this sensible technique. Ethiopia did something similar. You can do these things fast, but once you've established who owns land, then you can start to tax it and capture the appreciation. That's a big revenue potential that's completely missed. I, I just need to, to jump in here quickly because I agree with Paul totally on the revenue, that potential that is missed. But I, I must say, I do disagree on the ability to be able to do it easily in the, in the sort of Rwanda. So I agree, Rwanda did it amazingly, but Rwanda is a sort of a very special case compared to, and, and Kigali is a special case compared to other cities. And speaking from a city that has five coexisting land tenure systems, um, and there's a lot of cultural, historical, political background to that. So it's not just the sort of economic piece. It's very difficult to, 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 to unpack that um, in, in some senses as easily was that, as was done in Rwanda. So I just wanted to, to say, I agree with you on the, uh, the massive potential of land value, but I disagree on the sort of ability to, to, to necessarily do it as easily as Rwanda did in, in, in many other cities across the-, the danger, I remember having dinner with the head of the legal service in Ghana a few years ago and said, oh, you know, we've been trying to sort out land rights for, oh, for 40 years. And the implication was that as a lawyer, they'd be at least another 40. We can't wait. African urbanization's got to be over in the next 30 years. The next 30 years, it's got to happen. And so you need some quick and dirty method of getting a reasonable consensus on uh, locally on who owns what. And um, we can't leave it to the lawyers. Um, it's, it's, it's a process that can't end happily. Um, so, despair. A from, uh, Nancy Ammerman, uh, the gap between the village and microenterprise identity and the sort of collective purpose and commitment that you're talking about, Paul, um, it seems extraordinarily large. Uh, where do those dialogues happen? What role do intermediary civic organizations play, uh, I wonder, especially uh, about religious congregations, for example? So, I think you should be asking that to either Marcus or Astrid. They're sure to know more on the ground than I do. Mar Marcus, do you have any thoughts about, I, I mean, protest is something people turn to often when other avenues of, of influence are, are stopped. So. Do you, do you see potential for um, other forms of dialogue? Um, sure. I mean, I, I think in many ways, this is part of the, I mean, this is part of the argument that arose during the NSARS protest, which is that there were other forms of dialogue which were attempting to take place. In fact, there were uh, congressional hearings on the issue of police brutality, and yet, you know, basically you have uh, formal institutions going through this process saying that we're going to we're going to do something and there's a judgment, um, let's say, or, or there's a, some, some particular conclusion that doesn't get followed through. So housing in South Africa would be a good example of this, where you can get, um, there's a very famous case, uh, case where basically housing rights were, were reaffirmed to the constitution, and yet very little came from that actual, that, that ruling judgment. So on paper, it seemed like a, you know, a really important uh, watershed moment. And yet the follow through was not really there. Uh, in many ways, what it requires is both. It requires both mobilization on the ground and to the extent that it's, it's, po it's possible. So um, uh, mediation and, and mobilization through the formal institutions. Now that's not always possible. So in a country like South Africa, that is possible. You can do both. Um, so treatment action campaign was, is a really good example of the social movement, um, which was providing retrovials and, and access to healthcare, um, healthcare for uh, people suffering from HIV. Nades in South Africa. So that's a really good example where that has worked, where they're able to use legal avenues and uh, protest um, mm -hmm. to try to achieve their, their certain goals. But 
but again, housing is, is an example where you use, where um, basically legal contestation wasn't followed through consistently um, with street mobilization, or at least they weren't uh, connected as well as they should have been. And the result uh, didn't end up being uh, nearly as fruitful as people might've imagined. So I do think um, that the point about uh, mediation and, and working through other channels outside of street protests is, is extremely important. But the issue is that, and this, this goes to the main point, for many people living in um, these unequal cities, access to political institutions um, is not very easy to come by. And in some ways, protests can be an avenue for that. Now, that's not just to say that protests exist only in these instances where you don't have access to formal institutions. It goes back to my point that there's, there's different strategies that are available, in some cases more um, than in others, uh, but they're all important in that sense. Mm -hmm. Uh, sort of in a related uh, sense, uh, someone says, uh, Professor Collier, you've said we need communication communicators in chief based on bottom-up trusted and competent communications, but also there needs to be information communicated from the top down. Take, for example, the seriousness of all West African coastal cities of sea level rise. Um, I'm surprised you chose Lagos as a hopeful example. I think many people would be surprised about that given its reputation, but... Um, uh, in this particular case, isn't there uh, a progressive crisis looming uh, where there's going to need to be some very basic command and control strategies to get information to a fearful, skeptical public in order to inspire them to see the common good? Well, so, let me give you an example of where actually um, common purpose managed to cope perfectly successfully with um, with with the uh, with the threat of, of flooding, and that's that's the Netherlands, that's Holland. Right? Um, uh, two thirds of the country below sea level, um, uh, but they haven't drowned because they built systematically um, uh, defences against flooding, and that was achieved by a consensual process of dialogue within the society. Here's a common purpose: we will all drown unless we do something. And so they built dikes. There was the strategy. And then there was a mutual obligation to build and maintain them and pay for them. And so the same can happen in, in Lagos. I, I think you've been a bit harsh on Lagos. Lagos has had tremendous improvements over the last 20 years. Right? I've been going to Lagos for at least 40 years. I saw it go down from 1980 through to 2000, and I've seen it come back up again. Right? People who only go to Lagos for the first time in 2010 are horrified by it, but they don't see that it, even in 2010, it was a lot better than it had been. Um, and so, um, uh, and if you look at the numbers in Lagos, you see this great buildup of uh, revenues and very shrewd behavior by, for example, the governor of Lagos, he knows that he's dealing with a business community where they're not saints, right? um, uh, and they're coming to lobby him. What they really want is to lobby him for favors. Um, and what does he say? It's a very simple, practical idea. He says, okay, you can come and talk to me about your, your favors you want but I'll only meet you if first you show me your tax return. Yeah? And that very simple little gesture which, which said, okay, we're not gonna change the whole culture overnight, but we're gonna change this bit, you're gonna pay your taxes. There are a couple of questions about sort of the role of government in planning process. One that says the cities face pressures to restructure themselves with growing populations? How are people organizing to respond to heavy-handed top-down approaches to infrastructure projects? Thinking of the ways in which the government in Niamey, uh, Niger, raised neighborhoods, street side, informal business, et cetera, to make space for expanded roads and new construction leading up to the AU summit hosted there in 2019 and, and artists who spoke out against it wound up imprisoned. And someone else has also asked about, um, you know, is there a possibility for bottom-up approaches to urban, urban governance and to urban renewal? Uh, my own experience in, in Rwanda um, is the government there is very efficient. Um, and that's in part because it's not a terribly democratic government. Um, and certainly when you look at urban renewal in Kigali, one of the things that's been possible is for the government simply to wipe out neighborhoods because that's the government's choice. So 
how do we get a balance between public interest and government uh, organizing things in a way that re respects um, some democratic process and some some interest of the population? So I think this is why it is so important to get ahead of population growth in these cities, because if you if you try and get the infrastructure and the land grid in before people settle, then you don't have these awful tensions of do we move people out, which they don't want to do because they're a community, um, or do we leave uh, without any infrastructure? Even if you do move people out and try and fit the infrastructure retrospectively, it ends up costing three times as much, as far as we can see, uh, compared to just installing it before people arrive. And once you've tripled the cost of infrastructure, in effect, it becomes prohibitively expensive. And so it never happens. It's politically difficult to move people out and it's hugely expensive. And so it doesn't happen. And so the only option really is to do it before people arrive. And for that, the city needs a lot of money in order to be able to raise that money, it needs to establish some basic tax base so that with growing revenues, it can then borrow. That's the vital step. And um, build a credible rising revenue on the back of clear land rights that can be taxed. And then you borrow, and then you use that borrowed money to finance the keeping abreast of the growth of the city, keeping ahead of it. Thing. A somewhat different question from our own um, Catherine Lusk from the, the Initiative on Cities is what, what rights are available to rural migrants when they move to cities? How does their power manifest, if at all? Can they vote in local elections, for example? So as you're having this large... I, I, I think uh, it's one that I, I would like to, I mean, sure. as a, again, Uganda's, Uganda's going through an election right now. Uh, we're, we're in the, the, the height of it. And so you, you see a lot of how this manifests. I think Uganda is, is an example of a country where actually not only rural migrants, but even uh, refugees who come across the border have incredibly strong rights. Um, and, and often refugees also do come to the cities. Um, so, you know, we're talking also about, I think, uh, Catherine has had a second question about do they cross borders as well? And yes, we have, you know, just like um, people are looking for opportunities from rural areas, you know, refugees who come across the border also flock to cities in search of opportunities. I think one of the, the pieces that um, your question highlights and that I just wanted to, to, to draw upon, and it came up earlier was, you know, uh, well, it's come up as a theme throughout this conversation, which is this common purpose and the right in the city. I think, you know, we see a lot of backwards and forwards movement, movements between the urban and the rural. Uh, particularly because in most of the countries we're talking about, there's no social safety nets and the rural also provides a social safety net. We saw that, for example, very strongly right now and well, as we are now in the COVID-19 pandemic and where cities were locked down, the biggest impact actually was on urban populations and was on their ability to buy food. And so in a country like Uganda, actually the safety net there is to go back to your village where you can grow your food and you can eat your food. And that's why we don't, you know, in some ways, the city is only temporary. It's also where a lot of people go, you know, for retirement purposes, right? You know, the yeah. idea is to, to have your house in the city and build your home in, in, in your village, and that's where you are going to go to retire. Now, I think this, this is, you know, I think you can still build the common purpose in the city because there are certain things that you want to look for within your city. You know, you want a good school for, for your, your children, you want good access to healthcare. But I think we need to, to in my, my own personal perspective, we need to, to shift the narrative a little bit and, and, and factor in these sort of circular flow movements that we see because they play a very important purpose in terms of, of, the, urban, uh, of the urban populace. And another, you know, another example of that circular flow movement is remittances, right? And, 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 and money that is made in the city that is then sent back to the rural areas to support the rural areas. So how do we build our policies and how do we, we form a common purpose, taking into account that these circular flows happen and that they are important? Uh, so, Astrid, you had warned us that, you, that your internet might go out. Uh, it has not. It's actually been pretty, yeah. <laughs> pretty strong. But there's a question, what opportunities do digital infrastructure and technology offer for the transformation of African cities? Um, you want me to answer that? I didn't, it's, <laughs> I feel, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's funny because I, I hear sort of an under, undertone of this question on, on uh, the undertone of this notion smart cities and anyone who knows me knows that, 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 that phrase makes me shudder as uh, smart cities. But what I will say is I think the, um, Africa, unlike any other region in the world, is urbanizing in the most data rich time that we've ever 
had and we've ever seen. And this is a major opportunity if we are able to harness this data and use it in the right way. So for example, what Paul was just saying, um, putting infrastructure in an advance of population settling, that is something we can actually do because we actually know what directions populations are moving and settling, which, you know, back in, in the 19th century wasn't a possibility to, to really see. So let's use that. And I will also just say on that particular example, um, there are great examples on the continent and I'll take Hargeisa in Somaliland, a place where I work as well, as a fantastic example that actually doesn't put that much, doesn't have the money to put the infrastructure in before people are settled, has figured out where people are moving to and essentially just bulldozes the way free and says to people, don't settle here because once we have the money, we'll build a road and we'll, we'll build your water pipes. But that has the two effects of one, people are settling where the city wants them to settle and two, the space is free so you don't actually have to move the people once you actually have the money to build the road and put the water pipe in. So I think there are also uh, relatively uh, cheaper ways of, of ensuring that you keep that free. And I think data and the power of data really is an opportunity in that respect that we are able to allocate our scarce resources a lot more efficiently if we use data well. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, th I think our time is about to come to a, to a close. Um, and so I wanted to try to end on a, on a positive note. There are a couple of people who've asked of um, examples of best practices of cities that we can look at in, in Africa that uh, might be a model for, for other, other urban areas. Um, so maybe each of you can sort of offer your own perspective on where, where do you see things going better than, than elsewhere? What are some positive examples? Well, um, I think Kigali uh, is a, at the moment a city that works. Uh, it's livable. Um, uh, people can be productive. Um, it's, uh, uh, and it's safe. It's completely, you know, it's completely safe. I walked across central Kigali at midnight with not a, not a concern in my head, you know. Couldn't do that in London. So, um, uh, so there's one model. Um, uh, I think um, good things are happening in Addis. Um, I think good things are starting to happen in uh, Accra. So, um, so there, there are there are there are good there's good stuff happening all around, which actually Astro will know a lot more about than I do. I think it's difficult. Yeah, sure. I think it's difficult to, for me, um, given that I study protests, to think of a. a best case example. I mean, um, there's different models, you could say. Um, there's some potentially there's trade-offs between um, state capacity um, and democracy. Uh, but I would say the instances in which you've seen a rights-based framework being used and contestation over basic goods um, um, being, being fervently contested, uh, you could use cases like Cape Town uh, more recently. I mean, Cape Town is a city that's extremely unequal, and yet you have seen um, civil society um, groups like uh, Indifuna and Kwasi reclaimed the city uh, movement to try to fight for affordable housing. Um, there's been similar movements in Durban, Nabokali, Basin, and Jondolo, for those familiar with that, uh, where you've seen truly like ground, like, you know, you know ground up movements uh, try to fight for basic resources like housing, also contesting in elections, so scaling up from um, social movements to try to um, also affect formal institutions. That's not to say that those cases themselves are ideal in any way for the access that people need for basic resources. We've seen the issues around food security in South Africa with the COVID lockdown. But the idea of combining both, um, you know, these daily struggles for economic resources that are pervasive across the continent um, with a political framework and mobilization to try to contest for better access to those resources. Um, I think those would be some interesting cases, uh, particularly in, in South Africa. Astrid, what are your uh, positive cases? I no, see someone here, is, uh, what about in, in Botswana? Uh, yeah, um, so I don't know Botswana that well, although I've been there, but to very much to rural Botswana, so I don't know, uh, I don't know Botswana as well. But I will say I'm, 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 not, um, I'm not a massive advocate of, of thinking about city and city models. I think all of these cities are very much steeped in historical, cultural, political, geographical um, complexities that make, you know, that are going to require different things and different pieces. What I do see is within cities, just 
really shining lights and shining examples. And if I may end on my own city, which I know I've talked about a lot, but it is a city that I'm proud of. You know, I think just even in the municipal revenue space, we managed to, to increase our, our municipal revenues uh, threefold in the course of four years. And that was not through any changes in legislation or anything else. It was just about reconsidering the taxpayer as a client and providing services for the taxpayer. And how do we make it easier for them to pay? And how do we show them what their services are? And I think these are pieces uh, of city governance and of managing cities well that I think you know can be can be transferred and can be shown not only you know within Africa but as a shining light across the world. Well, I, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. Uh, we had a lot of questions, which uh, I think shows a lot of interest. I, I hope that this is just the beginning of a larger conversation that will go on. Um, obviously, urbanization is an issue that uh, people who have an interest in Africa are going to have to continue to deal with. So. Um, I hope we can have all of you back um, to talk, talk further about this. And thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to the Initiative on the Cities for organizing this. And uh, this, I believe, will be uh, available for people to see later. If you came in late and weren't able to see the beginning, um, it, it is being recorded and uh, we'll send out a message when it's available. So thank you, Astrid, Paul, Marcus. Thank you. Thanks.